Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Demetrius here and today we'll be discussing a topic that's very dear to my heart and that's photography. With regards to my brand that I have with uh, obphoto.com, obiphoto.com and you'll be able to see all my footage and videos and photography that I create online and with events and portraits and wedding photography and so on. But I wanted to create a short little video for you to bring you up to speed if you're not familiar with photography and this is just a beginner's course that I'm putting together very very small course and it's very light in terms of content I don't want to overwhelm you with all the jargon and all the wonderful things that we can do in photography but I want to get you started at least with photography and get you going now whether you're shooting on a camera or whether you're shooting on a phone these days it doesn't really matter the terminology and the concepts stay the same really at the end of the day so let me take you into a little free pdf and presentation i've put together for you just to introduce you into some of the topics and get you familiar with things and just highlight possibly some things you may not be familiar with just to introduce you into the photography world and Hopefully this will shed some light for you out there who are beginners, because this is not obviously designed to be a professional course. This is just designed for beginners to get going. And I hope it sort of helps you understand the very important details about photography that will just enhance your photography literally overnight. So let's, let's dive into this. I'm going to take you into this little screen over here, and I've got a little presentation set up for you. So this little mini course on, on photography and let's look at topic number one which is the photography terminology and this topic covers essential photography terms okay the, this is going to help beginners understand the cameras and how to improve their skills whether it's a camera on the phone or whether it is a, a, a mirrorless camera or a dslr it doesn't really matter so we're going to explore some key concepts like aperture aspect ratio shutter speed, focal length, autofocus and exposure. Those are very key attributes in photography and understanding these terms is crucial for sort of mastering photography and using your camera to its full potential. This also by the way includes video. So let's move on. Now let's talk about aperture. So I'm going to bring myself onto the screen so you can get an idea of what I'm doing here. Aperture control or controlling light and depth is quite an important thing. It's defined as the opening of the lens. So the, U, the, the circular opening of the lens that limits the quantity of the light that can enter an optical instrument like a lens. Okay, so it, it, mimic, it sort of manipulates that and handles the... I'd say the, the amount of light and also the quality of light coming in. It's one of the most primary controls of the camera to affect the outcome of a photograph. Very important, but it can also lead to very cool creative photography. Now on most cameras, the photographer can change this uh, size of this hole, right? So when you're looking at, for example, your lenses, so you've got the different F numbers on the lens. Let me take you into a little camera so you can see it. So here's a little camera over here. I've got a little Leica Q3 in my hand. It's a tiny little camera. As you can see, I've got a little section over here that digs through and shows the necessary F stops. What we call F stops is basically the, it's a number derived from the size of the aperture. In other words, how big and how small this little aperture inside gets bigger or smaller pretty much the same as a human eye okay so in terms of sort of the larger apertures they produce lower f numbers i know that's kind of strange right so a larger aperture will produce a lower f number so essentially when i have my little lens sitting at f 1.7 over here okay which is a pretty decent low light beast effectively this 1.7 is going to open up quite a bit that particular 
aperture. So it's going to open up those little blades inside the aperture, those little uh, octagonal or whatever different types of blades exist in the lens and bring in a lot more light. So it's actually better for low light capabilities. Okay. So essentially when you see a low F number, that means it's a very, very good and usually expensive lens. And the lower the F number, the higher or the larger the aperture, meaning, well, uh, I can bring in a lot more light. And then the smaller the aperture has the higher numbers. So if I progress from the F, like I've got an F 1.7 in that camera, in this camera over here, and lens specifically, this, we're talking about lenses here, okay? In this lens, I've got an F2 aperture, all right? So an F2 aperture on my Nikon Z8. Well, the F2 aperture is going to be much bigger than what you see here on the screen, okay? So it's going to be a bigger aperture, which means it can bring in a lot more light. And as I progress upwards, the scale, in other words, I get higher F numbers, then essentially what's going to happen is going to bring in less and less and less and less light into that lens and obviously onto the sensor. And of course, there is a very cool side effect of this. Of course, it's great for low light filming when you're doing low light photography and low light video. But what it also does is that when you have a higher aperture, in other words, when you have this f-stop being at 1.7, 1.8, uh, 1.4 you're going to get to see an out of focus area behind the subject that you're shooting like you can currently see right now in my video I've got it sitting at 1.8 as the video lens and you can see that it's a little bit blurred behind me okay so that is because I'm sitting at a f 1.8 if I go f 1.4 it's going to even be more out of focus behind the subject area so it creates this dreamy look in photographs okay so that's a cool thing about it but what it does do it also isolates the subject away from any background now that's useful for a lot of the photography but when you want to have the photograph <clears throat> and as many things in that photograph in focus as possible well then what you got to do is you got to stop down to create more of a smaller aperture to bring in less light in, which means it's going to concentrate what we call the depth of field. So the F stop as a number, it gets larger as you reduce the size of the aperture. However, what also happens is when you have a large aperture, when it's opened up quite a bit, which means it's like an F 1.7, F 1.2, and so on, because you've got a large aperture, your depth of field was going to create a lot more out of focus in the background. And as you get higher in these F numbers, F 4, F 5.6, F 6.3, F 7, F 8, F 11, and all the way up, you're going to get more and more and more of the subject matter and things around that subject in focus. So it depends on what kind of photographs you want to take, right? So depth of field, the aperture also affects this depth of field, okay? So the higher the F number, all right, that is an aperture with a small little hole will actually increase the depth of field. And this will in turn create what we call a long depth of field, which effectively means you're going to have a lot more in focus. Whereas if you make the aperture <clears throat> much larger, so you step down the f-stops and you go as close as you can to the, the lens's capability. In my case, the f1.7 is giving me an f-stop of much lower, almost, you know, quite a few stops lower than 2.8. So I now have the ability to really isolate the subject and have beautiful what we call out of focus in the background the classic name for that is bokeh b-o-k-e-h now that kind of helps with a little bit of creative control so by adjusting the aperture right by experimenting with say aperture control all right not all lenses have aperture on the lens itself a lot of the lenses have aperture in the buttons 
in the camera either behind or in the front depending on how you program them so for example my Nikon Z8 and I've got a Tamron 35 to 180 lens over here there is no aperture ring on the actual lens there's a zoom ring absolutely and there is a sorry there's a zoom ring over here for zooming into your photograph because this is a zoom lens and there's a focus ring over here for focusing so there's no aperture control on the lens so what you got to do is you got to either control aperture with a button in the front over here or however you want to program your aperture in the back and a lot of photographers love to use either one of the buttons to program to do aperture control i love both mechanisms i obviously prefer the older style where we have the aperture on the lens because it's very quick for me to be in the field and i can quickly adjust things without having to fiddle with buttons here and fiddle with buttons here i can just do that because i'm already holding the lens in the first place but it's a very different kind of photography it's the older style of doing photographs because i'm used to the film photography from when i first started so the idea that you're going to get this creative control you're going to get with aperture is really cool because you can have out of focus images and you can have in focus images and then you can have great bokeh nice out of focus in the background or you can have fully focused images in the front so it's quite important that you understand that okay the lower the f number the more light's going to come in but then you're also going to get a, a lot more out of focus in the background of the image the higher the f number less lights coming in because you're going to have a little pinhole of little light coming in which means you're going to get a lot more focused image because it's going to focus on that particular background it's going to lose its depth of field and it's going to have everything in focus very simple easy to understand All right the next topic to discuss is aspect ratio now aspect ratio in today's world is quite important because we've got to decide what do we want do we want wide shots do we want vertical shots do we want uh, a mixture or combination of the two do we want more portraiture landscape that kind of stuff do we want square photographs i mean i personally love the square look so what we need to consider when we take in photography is the aspect ratio is the ratio of the width of an image to its height pretty simple stuff right so usually usually the the ratio conforms to like a standard so the most common standards for viewing on say like a television will be a 16 by 9 ratio classic thing even in computers usually we do 16 by 9 or we do a multiple of that which is 4 by 3 okay now common camera options would be something like in terms of the ratios we get the most common which are 4 by 3 and three by two okay these are ratios widely used in digital photography and they can determine the final image obviously the other popular ratios which is one of my personal favorites is the one to one square ratio because you see when you have a 16 by 9 that's a pretty cool ratio it works in most devices a three by two and a four by three is quite different even though four by three is relatively close enough to uh, the 16 by nine and so is the three by two what you're going to find is you're going to find different types of photography lend to different ratios like a 16 by nine is ideal for landscapes absolutely wonderful for landscape photography and what you could also do is flip this over and then become a nine by 16 makes it a nice vertical shot so you can take great portraits that way so 16 by nine is exceptionally versatile three by two and four by three is very cool for things like very cl good close-up shots especially for video it is phenomenally cool for things like product photography it really helps with that aspect ratio and then the 18 by 6 which is quite unusual as an aspect ratio is very cool for panorama kind of photography so you have to choose the kind of aspect ratio you want to use and most cameras will either do 16 by 9 3 by 2 4 by 3 and another very popular one is the one to one ratio the square look i personally love square photography i'm used to square photography because i'm used to the old days where we used to take a photograph and used to have a polaroid and used to take a shot and then pa this thing would print out a nice photo and you would have a square photo available to you you could just stick it on your wall i'm used to printing photographs so i've always enjoyed the 16 by 9 4 by 3 and predominantly one-to-one -one ratio it's one of my most fun 
ratios to work with. But I would say the, the, the most cool ratios that I love using are my 4x3s and the 1x1s. On occasion, when I do landscape photography, I'll hit the 16x9. And if I have to do really intense portraits, I'll probably stick to the 4x3 or the 1 to 1. Unless I have to do a vertical longer shot of somebody, maybe a half body, full body, then I'll turn the 16 by 9 to the other side. I'll flip it over and I'll be a 9 by 16 to grab the entire body of that of that person. So, you know, you can play around with the different aspect ratios. It's pretty cool to do this. Now, the other thing also to worry about is shutter speed. You see, because when you're playing around with aperture, what's going to happen is your aperture is going to either Obviously, the bigger the aperture is going to let more uh, light in, the smaller the aperture is going to le let less light in. And as you move up the f-stops, let's say f4, f5, f6, and so on, you're going to lose light. So the problem with losing light is you need to somehow get this light back, right? Otherwise, you're not going to have the perfect shot. So what we have to our advantage is something really cool. We have this thing called shutter speed and shutter speed is an example of shutter speed. I have shutter speed at the top of my camera over here and this begins at a shutter speed, let's say uh, one second or whatever, two seconds, one eight seconds, 15, one thirtieth, one sixtieth, one twenty five, all the way to 2000. It's not the fastest shutter speed in the world. You know, when you have lenses and cameras like the Nikon Z8 and the Canon lenses and the Sony lenses, you know, they can do incredible sort of low end shutter speeds and seriously high end shutter speeds. So why do we use the shutter speed? OK, well, shutter speed in a way kind of works in reverse to aperture instead of allowing the light coming in, it's kind of keeping the light out because it, it follows the older technology we used to use, which we had a shutter going up and down, closing and opening in cameras. And essentially it's a speed thing. So the speed at which the shutter can close, controls the exposure level of the photograph. Now, of course, these days we don't necessarily have the mirrors anymore and the shutters and the shutters are not necessarily closing and opening. What we have is we have digital cameras today, right? And we have the way the sensor is reading, it's reading parts of the image going down like this. Okay, so it's kind of mimicking a shutter process. Now, the shutter speed is a very crucial element because it determines your, of course, not just the final look of your photograph, but very importantly, it can control your light coming in by limiting the light. But at the same time, it can isolate a, an, a subject while it's in motion. So fast shutter speeds, in other words, the higher the shutter speed can actually sharpen images of subjects that are in motion. You're freezing time, basically. It's ideal for like sports photography, great for capturing fast moving objects and so on. The slower shutter speeds, on the other hand, can give you some really beautiful effects like motion blur. OK, or, for example, when I do astrophotography and I shoot at, say, 90 second exposure, right? Uh, the idea of that is I'm reducing that shutter speed so slow so it stays open and scans a particular image I'm trying to scan for like 90 seconds or 30 seconds or 60 seconds, a full blown 90, 30, 60 seconds or whatever. Of course, I have to use a tripod for that. But when you do that, you can go and put your aperture at really high, like let's say F11 or F8 or something. So you can get a hell of a lot of sharpness. But remember, when you're reducing your aperture, reducing the hole, which means less light comes in. So what you can do is you can bump up the shutter speed in terms of lowering it in this case, and you can reduce the shutter speed down so it doesn't close that quickly. And then it lets time pass and lets the light come into the sensor, essentially giving us a long exposure image. And I can create light trails and get all the stars. And actually, that's how you pick up the stars in the Milky Way, because I mean, your eyes can't do that. You can't slow down your eyes that much. Usually humans can see 24, 30 frames, 60 frames a second. You can't really go at like 5,000 frames a second to truly see what's happening. So this is the thing about slow shutter speeds. It allows the light to come in. OK, but with this, of course, you have to be very cautious because 
Well, if you go lower shutter speeds, you're going to introduce a bit of motion blur, okay? If you go higher shutter speeds, you're going to have far more isolated in terms of the subject matter. However, the more you go lower in your shutter speed, the more light comes in. And unfortunately, as you want to get higher shutter speeds so that you can capture that motion that freezing car driving around a race course track or a football player running on a track or a rugby player or a tennis or basketball or, or golf for that matter. The, the thing is, as you get higher in the shutter speed, unfortunately, it's going to also bring in less light. Do you see where the, the, the real intricacy comes in? So there needs to be a fine balance between aperture and shutter speed. And sometimes you may need to unbalance things, have a higher shutter speed and forsake a little bit of the light and so on. So the shutter speed is great for things like balancing out motion, freezing the action, but unfortunately going lower because it brings in more light, it will introduce things like um, motion blur. And if you go faster and higher speeds, well, yes, you're going to definitely freeze the action. But unfortunately, if you don't have a good aperture lens to be able to stop down and have an f1.2 and f1.8, then because you're going higher shutter speed, you may end up having a darker image. So there are ways and trade-offs around this. I personally love as low aperture as possible and highest shutter speed that I can go so that I can get the best possible balance between the two. Okay. Now, the other thing that's quite important is what we call focal length. So for example, this particular lens is a 28 millimeter. Although in the camera, I can shoot a 28 millimeter. I can drop it to 35. I can go to 56. 75 and close to 90 millimeters with this but as i do that in the software itself unfortunately i lose the quality of my pixels so i lose megapixels i'm not overly worried because this leica q3 can shoot 60 megapixels at the 28 millimeter and when it drops all the way down say to 90 millimeter i still get a 12 megapixel image for those of you who are concerned, by the way, when you're watching 4K video on your television, that's only a four megapixel image. OK, depending on your type of 4K, it might reach four to eight megapixels at the most. Now, when you're printing images, you can probably get away with zooming A2 images onto print easily with a 12 megapixel for a photo. So I'm never concerned about, you know, stopping down on say the Leica Q3. However, the advantage of having good focal length allows you to do things like magnification and perspective. So the idea of focal length is that say the distance between the center of the lens and its focus that it can do basically and this is called a focal length and it usually is represented in metric millimeters okay where the lens is described as having the range between say a minimum and maximum adjustment so for example this little lens over here has got a focal length of 35 millimeter all the way to 180 millimeter so when i zoom out I'm going to hit 180 millimeters and when I zoom back down again, I'm going to get 35 millimeters, which covers a great range, an absolutely incredible range. And that's why I have that lens on my Z8, because I just need one lens to cover that entire range and still keep high quality because, well, the lens is an F2 to 2.8 lens, which is phenomenal in terms of low aperture range. And of course, being the Nikon Z8, its shutter speeds capability are second to none, are unbelievable shutter speeds. So what we get with a long zoom lens, for example, we get this magnification, which is really cool. So the longer the focal length, the higher the magnification you get from the camera you're using. This allows photographers to sort of capture distant subjects in detail. So I can really, for example, let's say I've got a nice portrait shot. I can drop down or I can go basically to 110 millimeters. And once I get 110, I can be at a decent distance. And when I capture that portrait of somebody at 110 millimeters, what it does, it compresses the background behind them. It sort of brings it in nicely and tightly. And it creates a beautiful out of focus in the background. But at the same time, isolates my subjects really well from the background. 
because of this magnification and compression we call this the compression on lenses it really is a cool thing when you have a lens that can do that telephoto means when you want to do telephoto you want to have something that really zooms out now this is just a zoom lens although it can be classified as a telephoto because it goes from 35 to 180 okay i do have as you can see a um sorry a lens behind me over here that's a little crazy lens over there that is a 180 millimeter all the way to a 600 millimeter that's what you call a telephoto lens that is a true telephoto lens and that's usually for my wildlife photography i'll be doing a video of that lens in the future now you also have wide angle now this is the classic wide angle my leica q3 has the 28 millimeter it's the wide angle lens it's a pretty decent angle and it's a shorter focal length provides a wild view wild sort of field view it's great for landscapes architectural photography street photography that kind of thing and of course there is a distinct difference say between a zoom and a prime now <clears throat> the thing about zooms is compared to primes this is a prime lens it's a singular lens it doesn't zoom out it's a 28 millimeter although i can do different focal lengths in the camera it is essentially a 28 millimeter and that's a prime lens because it's prime it's smaller lighter higher capability when it comes to aperture because this is a 1.7 because there are no moving parts essentially in the lens there's no need for you know zooming out and zooming back in because it stays at 28 millimeters the difference is i can crop in the camera and create that kind of effect but the difference between a prime and a zoom lens is the quality of the image you're going to get superior quality images with prime lenses depends on the primes you're using it depends on the zoom lenses you're using this particular lens that i have the 35 to 180 even if because it's a zoom lens its ability to shoot f2 to 2.8 at that range the 835 all the way to 180 it really is really close to a prime it's not a prime essentially but it's very close to the quality of prime lenses but would would it compete say with a true 35 millimeter prime no it wouldn't because this is a 2.2 f2 to 2.8 out of 35 it's an f2 while a prime lens would be f1.4 or 1.2 whereas if i had a 56 millimeter or an 85 millimeter or 120 millimeter or something like that they would be at an f 1.2 range so the aperture would be phenomenal okay and in those cases those are the higher quality lenses as prime lenses to do really intense high-end photography and usually i would uh, i prefer using prime lenses when i'm doing very high-end professional shoots like portraits and so on and if i'm going to do weddings and i want to do run on the run gun i want to do sports photography i want to do uh, wildlife i will probably hit the zoom lenses it really depends with landscapes i like my prime lens uh in fact i do my landscapes literally with a leica q3 system it's got a 28 millimeter it's good enough for what i needed and um, that includes astrophotography so at the end of the day there's a fine line between a choice of zoom versus prime personally i just choose the right product at the right time but here's a little diagram for those of you interested so you're going to have ultra wide lenses okay i just went to the wide angle at the moment i've talked i've talked about a 28 millimeter and a 35 millimeter but you can go even wider with a focal length and you can go down from 12 20 millimeters 15 millimeters is even 10 millimeters today it gets quite crazy but as you go there there's going to be a distortion in the lens but what it does it puts a lot more of the subject matter in the picture so it's phenomenal for landscapes it's great to get a wide angle uh or what we call an ultra wide angle in your mixed in your bag because you're going to achieve incredible landscape results but can you still do landscapes with 35 and 24 millimeters and 28 absolutely 100 i would say landscapes it depends on when you want to when you want to get a nice distance shot these are very good focal lengths if you are doing say uh, landscapes but you're doing it like an iceland or you're doing it in you know in, in places which are so remote and you can probably only shoot from a from a boat and you want to capture big sort of mountain areas and so on then actually a telephoto lens with a massive zoom of 600 
which like mine, the 180 to 600 is pretty decent for those kind of landscapes because I'm capturing different kind of landscapes there. But essentially, I would say the, the wide angle lenses are typically landscape type of astrophotography and potentially uh, uh, some portrait photography and, and definitely these are for street photography, no doubt about it. When you start hitting the 50 millimeters, 70 millimeters, 80 millimeters, 90 millimeters, 75 millimeters, all of that, that's typically the what your eye can best see. So in other words, your human eye, actually, the human eye, a lot of people misunderstand this. They think that a 50 millimeter is the true eye of a human. Actually, that's incorrect. The true eye what your eye can see the natural way during the day is around 45 millimeters. That's usually the case. You can calculate it mathematically, actually. So if you have lenses that are between the 50 and the 90 millimeters, that's pretty much what the human can see. And it's why the photographs look so wonderful when you're doing portrait photography. So anything between, say, you can do portraits in 35, but you might have distortion, you might have items that are closer to this to the lens they're going to be looking bigger than normal so a bit goofy but if you have between 50 and say 110 millimeters 135 millimeters all the way to 200 millimeters i would say that this entire range would be the range for 99 percent of your photography so it's everything from portraits all the way to weddings to sports shooting to everything you can possibly think of where it differs is when you have massive telephoto reach and then when you go between 400 all the way up to 800 and 1000 depending if you use a teleconverter when you use those kind of distances those kind of focal lengths you're going to need you know lenses like i have behind me which are monster telephoto lenses and for that kind of thing it's mainly for wildlife it's mainly for things at a distance because you know, especially when you want to keep safe away from, say, a wild animal or something like that. You know, you want to use something like a telephoto lens. So that's really um, good enough for telephoto. But when you go super telephoto, you can reach some really interesting locations, especially if you can't go near the subject and they're like, I don't know, 200 meters away or something like that. Yes, then you need something like a 600 to an 800. And that's where a lot of the professional photographers stick within that if they're doing wildlife photography. Right, the next thing is focusing. Now, focus is quite important. There's a very important reason to either use manual focus or to use autofocus. I personally, when I do videography, I will stick to manual photography. Uh, sorry, manual sort of focusing. So essentially what will happen is I like to focus in my, my, my camera and my lens and I leave it at that. I don't like the idea of a lens constantly analyzing focus when I'm doing video because I, I'm going to get the focus breathing and I don't care what manufacturer you are Sony Canon Nikon they all have focus breathing if you go and, and including the lenses some of them are so good that you can hardly see it but when you dig into the video footage you can see it so the thing is if you do manual focus in video that's more more than you need and you can just pull focus when you need to pull focus and you can get your shot now in photography the difference is if you do manual photography as in manual focusing you have to be really good at what you do now the one advantage that we have with modern cameras today the like a q3 for example the new canon cameras the new nikon cameras the new sony cameras the fujifilm cameras the olympus cameras the panasonic cameras they're all amazing cameras they have built-in capabilities in the cameras now that allow us to when we do manual focus to have what we call uh, the focus area lit up so you can see different parts of that image when they are in focus they're going to be a particular color you choose i choose the color red so i can see oh that stuff is in focus and then i can take my shot in many scenarios i like manual focus because i'm so used to the older way of doing photography however when i have fast moving subjects sports photography fast events weddings and stuff like that. I don't want to muck around with manual focusing. I will do autofocus. And there's very interesting sort of things that you can do with autofocus. So there's manual focusing, there is autofocus continuous, and autofocus, for example, on a singular autofocus, and so on. So, for example, if you use something like manual focus, you control the entire focus, right? If you have autofocus continuous, it's going to 
grab and do an acquisition of that particular subject and it's going to continuously focus and try and keep focus very useful there's also autofocus single and this is an example it's slightly different in every camera manufacturer but the idea is when you press the shutter button down uh, halfway or you have a back button focus whichever one you choose it'll do a very quick focus and it'll achieve the focus and you take your shot but it won't do continuous focusing and then you can also do autofocus sort of automatic and also with AI or machine learning today a lot of cameras today have this built in so they can do some really incredible focusing they can pretty much isolate the subject continuously follow them grab the body grab the face grab the eyes they're pretty impressive pretty impressive and today for example Canon uh, announced and launched the Canon R1 for example which does really incredible focusing to the point where it's preemptively knowing the kind of focusing you're going to do because you tell it I'm going to shoot basketball I'm going to shoot volleyball I'm going to shoot football or soccer and it knows okay constantly keeps track and it's an incredible system but you know Sony Nikon they're all incredible and it depends on the photographer really the photographer is where the key is you've got to know your type of photography to capture the right image and especially with autofocus so autofocus is very cool and you have a choice between manual and autofocus and the different autofocus modes of course many photographers like the convenience of autofocus it's obvious okay and uh, there is luckily the manual focus some cameras essentially have the options of manual focus and autofocus in their button allocation other manufacturers have chosen to put the manual and autofocus in the lens so you can have it in the barrel so you can activate and click the autofocus or not it depends on what you know the manufacturer is doing but they're all pretty much on par and how they work right then one of the key and most important aspects in photography see aperture is one thing and shutter speed is another but there is one other defining attribute that's very critical in photography and that is the balancing of light and you know when you the idea of balancing of light is the act of say the rays of light in coming into into that photosensitive sort of sensor whether it's a phone or whether it's a camera it doesn't matter that's called what we call exposure it comes from the legacy days when we had sort of very large cameras and medium format cameras where we had this thing called ISO and specific film was a type of ISO, ISO 100, ISO 200, ISO 400. And that would allow a very particular kind of light coming in and quality of light, the right balance of light. A lot of the times you might have an ISO of 100 or ISO of 200. I'm currently now video shooting with ISO 200. Sometimes you might need ISO 400. It really depends on whether you're shooting indoors or outdoors. But the key is, the amount of exposure will determine how light or dark an image will appear and the problem is the higher the ISO these numbers naturally go higher so they'll go say from a low of depending on your camera I have an ISO of 50 in my Leica Q3 so my little Leica Q3 has a low ISO of 50 it can go lower but it hits a low ISO of 50 and my Z8 can hit the base low ISO of 64 and it goes even lower to something close to 30 ISO so that's very cool and in the higher ISOs uh, the problem is the higher you hit your ISO the, the, you, you, that you add ISO yes you're going to allow the ability to take in more light the problem is because of that sensitivity it's going to introduce noise as in grain in your photographs so the key is to balance the ISO with your aperture and your shutter speed and once you balance those three things the ISO sensitivity which will determine you know whether it's a high ISO value or low ISO sometimes you know you want to go low aperture and you want to have high shutter speed so you can balance those two out and then unfortunately the image is still dark so then you have to bump up the ISO to get it to the point where you get a decent image and the sad part is because of that unfortunately you're going to introduce more noise now the great thing is with the camera manufacturers that we have today Sony particularly and Nikon particularly they're very good at the high ISO levels phenomenally good at those so you can literally shoot at high ISOs 
and actually don't have a big problem with your noise at all because in most cases the noise is very well handled in the actual camera so by experimenting with this what we call an exposure triangle the combination of ISO aperture and shutter speed is where the real trick comes in and you'll notice that kind of balancing when you open up your camera and you go and you see inside your camera you see there's a little grading system at the bottom there if it goes too much towards the left it's going to be a darker image if it goes too much too much on the right hand side it's going to be overexposed as an image so you must try and get that little line to the middle as possible and when you get that little line there it means your camera knows well it's telling you that that's the optimal possible condition of that camera so essentially what's going to happen is different manufacturers will have it slightly different in this scenario it has it on the on the right hand side and if I have my little line going to the middle then I know that I'm going to have the optimal possible exposed triangle and condition for my photos and the key is working with this particular triangle so the ISO let's say we start at a hundred it's a bright environment and it's less sensitive to light whereas as you get higher in the ISOs it's a dim environment so now we need to make the actual sensor in the camera more sensitive to light to accept more light but by doing that we're going to unfortunately add more noise so this is where we have to balance it out with a shutter speed experimenting with higher or lower shutter speeds and then we also have to balance it out with apertures to experiment with the low f-stop numbers and the higher f-stop numbers and you can see that actually f 2.8 for example is pretty close to the 1600 iso so that's a very good sort of combination of things if you're looking at an f4 actually a good iso level will be 800 and so on so when you're looking at this exposure triangle it's very important to get that right in your mind take a bit of time study the triangle you'll understand that you know by shooting at say a particular type of shutter speed you then have to really work at the aperture and you have to work at the ISO level so for example when I want to shoot say in this example and I like a Q3 for example I have my like a Q3 sitting at 1.7 f uh, f-stop the thing is though I need to experiment with my shutter speed here at the back so I can make sure that I'm getting that balance right and once I have that then I can know okay the ISO that I have to deal with and the the run of the mill or the the rule of guide is very simple let's say this is a 28 millimeter okay 28 millimeter what you should do is you should double that and that should be really your shutter speed for that length of lens if you can try and keep to that then you're great so essentially that's for normal shooting if you're going to have fast moving subjects then all bits are off things have to change you have to go to higher shutter speeds but if it's just normal photography shooting normal people um, scenarios uh, it's not sports or anything it's not fast moving subjects it's like a little portrait or whatever you take your lens you double up that shutter speed and basically let's say I've got a 28 millimeter well effectively it's close to 30 so 30 times 2 60 so I should have a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second so 1 over 60th and that will give me the ultimate type of shutter speed for example I have this Tamron here and it's a 35 millimeter so I really should be looking at say something close to 70 maybe 80 shutter speed um, if I want to have the ideal shots and as soon as I hit the 180 millimeter well that's going to be pretty high so I'm going to try and get as close as I can to ISO 400 ISO 350 ISO 400 that'll be the ideal sort of shutter speed just for normal photography however when it comes down to shooting fast moving subjects and so on well this is where <laughs> you have to get this balance right and that takes time takes practice takes learning how your lenses work takes understanding how your cameras work and then eventually you'll get it right don't always leave your cameras at automatic and let the cameras trying to decide the triangle because they're pretty good at what they do I'll give them credit especially some of the latest cameras today like Canon Nikon and Fujifilm and Sony so they're all good but the thing is 
there's going to be one or two compromises here and there. So rather shoot manual and then shoot raw as well. So that you can always go back to that photo and edit that photo if you have to. Shooting just pure JPEGs is only for certain specific situations. But if you can shoot raw, you can go back and really experiment with your photos. So let's say you had no choice. You had to go higher shutter speed to isolate your subject, but you only had an F2 lens. All right, which means now all of a sudden it's a little darker. So now you have to increase the sensitivity. Well, you can do that and then you can go back into post-processing with RAW and then reduce the noise, denoise. Or what happens if you've had no choice? You've got to go as low as ISO as possible. And then all of a sudden, well, you, you went a little bit higher with the aperture so you can get a lot more in actual focus. But now your shutter speed is a pretty normal state and the image is lower than that little line that's supposed to be in the middle. Well, that's okay because you have your raw file, you can press up, you can push the highlights and the shadows and actually expose more of that image. Bear in mind, because it'll have low ISO, you'll have far less noise in the actual image. And it's not ISO, it's ISO, okay? So essentially the higher ISO value, this increases the sensitivity, which essentially will add more noise so the lower the iso the better your photography will be run of the mill so if you can try and get as low aperture as possible if you want out of focus areas or as focus as possible higher aperture or if you want to have as higher shutter speed as possible to freeze action or as low iso as possible then you can try and figure out the kind of photography you want to try and get out of your camera or your phone camera okay now of course learning photography goes sort of beyond this kind of terminology so we've learned a couple of terms today those of you who are brand new in photography just take the time to go through this little pdf it won't take long just to reiterate everything in your mind you're more than welcome to download this for free i don't ask you for contact information or email addresses or anything like that just click the link and download the pdf and this will help you sort of remember things if you need to. Remember, practice will actually make perfect. It'll get you to the point where you're taking really terrific photographs. It's going to take a while. Okay, Don't rush the, 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 the process. Learn how to use the cameras. Learn how to use your, your lenses. And slowly, you will get there. Explore all the different details in your camera. And then continuously learn. Right? Continuously learn. Now, let's look ahead. What we're going to do next when this particular course continues with the next topic, I'm going to take on the concepts of digital versus film photography. So we're going to look at this little section here, this topic now, and conclude this now in terms of terminology. And then it's worth noting the world of photography is very diverse, okay? And it's ever-changing. And so what we're going to do is in our little next sort of uh, segment and topic, I'm going to talk about digital photography versus film photography, and we'll look at the pros and cons around those two otherwise thank you for listening everybody i know this was a very basic sort of view of photography and the concepts apply for both cameras and phones phones are particularly good at taking photographs today they're very good at videography especially and nothing wrong with that the concepts stay the same now to my subscribers, thank you for subscribing. I appreciate your time. Anybody who's new to my channel, thank you. I appreciate your time as well. Anybody who's willing to subscribe, it doesn't cost you anything. Click the little button, just turn on the subscription and basically the, uh, the, the notification bell, it'll just let you know when I create new videos. And also it tells the YouTube algorithm to give my videos to other people that haven't seen the videos. That's all it is. There's no kickback to anything else. Otherwise, thank you for your time. Thanks, everyone. And once again, this is today a small little topic on a little mini course that I'm going to sort of help people in terms of beginners, in terms of photography. And there's nothing wrong with being a beginner. We all start somewhere there. And even, you know, when I take great shots, when I take terrible shots, I still think I'm a beginner 37 years later. Even though, even though I've worked in very high-end fashion, very high-end photography shoots, it doesn't matter. I always like to think of myself as someone who's learning because that's the ultimate journey of photography, to constantly learn new things. So our next topic will be the difference between digital and film photography. And yep, it's still around. And film photography is very important because it does lend to all these terminologies we've spoken about today. And thank you for your time. It's Demetrius here again today from OB Photo.
obiphoto.com. Signing out.